Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Acre Thursday on Apex Express Radio. I'm your host, Robin Gurung, and I'm from Asian Refugees United, one of the 11 organizations from the Asian American Civil Rights Equality Network, also known as the Acre Network. Today, we are reflecting on Asian Refugees United's Camp for Emerging Leaders, and we will be interviewing Nawal Rai, Kamana Dimal, and Chandra Bastola to share about their experiences of participating at Asian Refugees United's annual youth leadership camp. Asian Refugees United, also known as ARU, is an art and healing leadership center. Our mission is to cultivate and restore wholeness in communities impacted by displacement through embodied training programs, collective power building, ancestral practices, and connection to land. We envision a home and belonging for all. ARU started in 2016 in the San Francisco Bay Area. Currently, we are operating in two states, our headquarter in California and our youth center in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Asian Refugees United designs and produces a year-long youth leadership training program called Camp for Emerging Leaders, also known as CAMP. CAMP is an immersion experience into the many elements of personal and community transformation. This program is designed to build a network of vibrant community of refugee leaders, organizers, artists, and activists to become as in change. Each year, the theme and the focus of the program are developed collaboratively by project coordinators and participants to be responsive to the needs of the community. This year, we had about 20 young and emerging leaders participate in our program. Each of these participants were divided into three groups based on their interest areas, a storytelling group, mental health group, and educational group. Tonight, we have Noel Rai from the storytelling group, Sandra Vastula from the mental health group, and Kamana Dimal from the education group. I want to welcome each one of you on this show tonight. Welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. How about we begin with um, each one of your introductions? Tell us who you are. Yes, so, Kamala, um, you want, all right, Chandra, you want to begin? Yeah. So, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chandra Mastola. I am one of the former refugees from uh, Nepal. I was born in refugee camp and lived there for like 14 years. After that, uh, we migrated to United States uh, from Oli. Um, at the beginning, we came to Scranton, Pennsylvania, where our current uh, President Biden was born there. And um, I I lived there for like, I think, eight years. I did my high school there and went to college after that. After graduating college, then uh, we moved to Harrisburg. So currently I'm living in Harrisburg. And uh, I'm also working in one of the major pharmaceutical company as a business analyst. Um, and also I'm currently working as a volunteer in one of our community organization, a religious organization. And I'm working there as a media coordinator. Uh, that's pretty much it from my side. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Noel, do you want to go next? Hi, um, I'm Noel Wright. Uh, I am a 21 years old college student. Um, I currently attend Des Moines uh, Area Community College here in Des Moines, Iowa. And I was born and raised in Nepal uh, in Patri Camp, uh, where I spent um, almost my uh, 12 years of life there in, uh, in camp. 
and I moved here in Des Moines back in 2013. Um, since then, I have been living uh, in Iowa, in Des Moines, Iowa, and I have been right now just focusing on school and also trying to work with Asian, um, Asian Refugee United to like volunteer and give my time to my community. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Doll. Hello, I'm the last participant for this interview. I was born in also the Bhutanese refugee camps and my journey to the United States started when I was only five years old. And so many people ask me like, what do you remember about Nepal? And my response is always the same. I was so young. So like a lot of my memories started here, although I am still fluent in both Nepali and English because my parents never allowed me to like feel otherwise. But I don't really have a lot of memories from the camps. I do have a, a very, like remember everything from like here from like starting kindergarten here all the way to where I am currently. So I'm currently a senior in Penn Manor High School, which is a high school in suburban Lancaster. I don't know if you guys are ever er, ever heard of the area, but it is a small city in central Pennsylvania, and I'm planning for college right now, and ARU is kind of helped with that to see that I really love social work, so I'm planning to major in social work and also be on the pre-med track. Great, thank you, thank you all of you. Um, I mean, all of you mentioned that uh, you all uh, were born in refugee camps in Nepal, I mean, Kama and I uh, started uh, sharing about some of the experiences. Like, um, I'm curious, like, you know, Noel and Chandra, uh, do you have any, uh, do you want to share any experiences of growing up in the refugee camps? Um, any fond memories or challenges? Um, yeah, I can, I can go with that. Um, when I think about back home, um, back home in refugee camp, sometimes, like, it feels like a dream and like that sounds so cliche but it's like sometimes it feels like this is a life that you know i like i didn't i don't feel like i lived that life um in this life you know because it just the life that i live now is so 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 different than the life that i grew up the, the place that i grew up in so um such thing just like just housing let's like you know talking about housing um, the houses, like the, the things that we have right now, um, let's talk about those little things like heater, coolers, you know, like that little basic needs uh, to survive. Though we, that, those were things not very necessary um, for the temperature that we live in, um, that we grew up in, but still like those little things that really make me think sometimes and how um, things that I take uh, for granted now, nowadays um, and Growing up in Nepal, I feel like there's just this feeling of nostalgia, like uh, that I that I get just like thinking about eating. You know, having to get to eat one piece of candy was that would bring so much happiness, and you know that is not the same and, uh, anymore. And it just I miss I miss being grateful. I um. Not saying that I'm not grateful right now. Now, but just the fact that, like, you know, I was able to find that little happiness, or I was able to appreciate these little things. Um, so those things are definitely something that I miss a lot about. Um, because here, our life is our life really does depend on, like, you know, we're always busy, and I feel like we kind of miss track of focusing on little things, being um, thankful for. The little things that we have um and yeah that's that's something i really miss and i remember just um being happy and like the most without having this reason to like you know to uh especially like uh anything that was and like anything big or anything you know like especially with the money and stuff we didn't grow up with the money and it it's I I see the feeling. I miss the feeling of just being home and like feeling of uh, being connected to the people that I lived around with. Um, so that's kind of where my a lot of my memories comes from. That feeling of 
that community and it's just being surrounded by people that um that knows you know that you feel that makes you feel like you're at home so that's that would be my take on that thank you so much now how about chandra uh so I seriously feel like I'm missing out a lot. Like I wanted to uh, relive that life again. You know, it's so much uh, memory attached to it, it's emotion and everything. Like from your childhood to the teenage point, right? And going through those little uh, little hurdles and everywhere, going out of the boundary, playing with kids, like who is to play the ball you know with with the socks you know we used to make a ball with the with the yeah, socks yeah. and the wrapping <laughs> wrapping papers and everything right and just running down and when it's raining just splashing the water and then swimming in the river so it was a lot of fun i mean i wish i can relive that life again you know and which is truly missing here i mean we don't normally get to experience that in here um when comparing to a lot of kids nowadays, you know, they are raising, we were, they are like raising in America currently. They don't have much option other than like playing on phone and they don't have touch to the nature. They can't connect to nature as they only go maybe vacation once a month or not even once a month I and mean, once a year, right? So that kind of the environmental touch, the essence in your life is missing. And I wish I can relive that childhood. I mean, a lot of memories and beautiful uh, time is spent with other friend and neighborhood. Um, that that the brotherhood that we share in community. So, yeah. I I suddenly miss that um, that time that we, yeah we used to spend in the open field. Um, definitely the sense of community, right? Mm -hmm. um yeah and like novel said the the sense of appreciation to folks uh the people who have uh tossed our lives in the refugee camps right mm -hmm. um yeah um kamana already kind of started uh on this um i wanted to kind of hear the the experiences of uh, uh that, that the, the in during the transition like from the refugee camp to resettlement in the united states like what was it like what do you remember uh can you share uh, some of the experiences of uh, that transition from the camp to the united states Kamala? sure of course i really appreciate hearing about chandra and all those experiences because for me I didn't live those experiences by actually living it because I don't remember it, but I lived through those experiences because of those stories that I hear. So it's always so nice to hear about my birth country. For me, um, coming to the United States at the young age of five, I also had two older siblings, right? And for them, I feel like the transition might have been a little bit harder. But for me, I got out of ESO when I was in the second grade. I was told I was always bright. So for me, it was really easy to catch the like culture here and also to learn the language. But for me, I just really struggled with uh, imposter syndrome. And I also really struggled with like the differences in culture, the taboos that my parents would tell me. And then I'd go outside of my house and I'd be like, that's not what's true out there. Like I talked a lot about um, menstrual struggles that I've had before with like the taboos and stuff and a lot of my writing that I do because I feel like it's really important to acknowledge that because in um, the Nepali society it's told that like menstruation is impure and stuff like that but as soon as I'd like step outside of my house like everyone, even on my period, they would still hug me. I would still be able to eat with them. In fact, I was working at like a fast food place where I was making food for people during my menstruational cycle back at home. I was not allowed to sit at the table. So I think things like that are just what like really touched me. And I just struggled with my identity until I think it was like middle school when I transitioned from like a city school into more of like a suburban rural um, school district and from there 
that's when I felt like cultural shock because while the city school was really populated with like racial ethnicities, my um, rural schools were more like filled with white kids. And that's when I felt like I was like a sore thumb in the midst of like so many blonde hair and like white skinned people. I felt really left out and I struggled really, really hard then. But then after I got through that phase and after I accepted my identity, and I learned a lot more about my background and the reason why we have menstruational taboos was actually that it's for sanitary purposes, right? It's not because I was impure. It was because before they didn't have stuff like menstruational pads. They didn't have tampons. So that's why they would keep the girls a little bit separate from their families. So after I learned the reality instead of the taboos, that's when I learned to accept myself. That's when I learned to accept the culture. And that's also when I learned to educate others and embrace my culture. So for me, it was just learning a, li a little bit more about what I didn't know and also getting a lot closer to my family. Wow, what, what a journey, Kauna. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Chandra uh, and Nawal, um, how was your experiences like during the, the transition time? Um, I want to share um, the transition time from the refugee camp to the new land, uh, the United States of America. Uh, what was it like? Um, the experiences, or the emotions, the challenges, or any fond memories that you want to share? Yeah, so um, initially, um, if you want to start, start from the beginning, I think um, at the initial phase, right, it did not meet our expectation because uh, uh, back in the camp when we were given orientation about the America, right, uh, we were shown a different picture of the America. And then when, when it came to the real ID, it was not as what they showed in the picture, right? In, in those videos, like um, in orientation, they had shown like so much luxury and everything. Like the, the boss would come to pick your kids, take you to home, right? Uh, take, you, take them to school, bring them back to home. And all those facilities that they were uh, swinging in those orientation. But um, when we came to the reality, that was not true. I mean, it could be true for some people, but for in our case, that was not true. So we had completely different experience. We had to walk to the school every day. And my school was like, I think two miles away from my house. So I had to wake up early in the morning and go to school, walk two miles, come back two miles, right? And it was so challenging. And then we didn't even know, I didn't even know how to use the public transportation at that time. And on top of that, like blending into the new culture and speaking English was the end of the hurdle to come over, right? Because uh, we had a British English accent and then it does not match up with the Americans. So people normally used to make fun of you and being har harassed in a school while well, taking public trans transportation. So there are a lot of challenges at the beginning. And as as a time went through, and then we started to learn about the new culture and started to knowing more about the cities and how things work, then it eventually started getting better. So it takes at least three, around like two to three years to adapt to new cultures and learning new things in community. Yeah, so it was initially challenging for me. Yeah, um, I can go. I'm sorry. <laughs> sure, go ahead, No. Sorry to cut you off, Dai. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. Um, kind of just piggyback, uh, piggyback, uh, piggyback off like just what Kamana said and uh, Chandra. Like, for me, it was, like the transition to the state was, a, it was like a climbing a mountain, basically, <laughs> just because of... Um, a lot of things, it was just a big cultural shock. Um, first of all, like go back in Nepal, I was a very um, 
not go America. Like, I know, like, I was kind of like um, against immig- immigrating to the States. And like, I, um, which I don't, res- I don't really remember exactly why, but um, coming to coming here and it's, it w- it's a different experience, you know, like you come to this, to this place and space where um, you have only fantasized of like, you know, that you have only heard of um, through stories, through movies. And, and like, when you actually get there, it's not, it's not all that, you know, it's not all the fancy, um, fancy, like fancy dinners or like, you know, this nice, beautiful, big houses or like this and that. So like, to come to the States and like being put into this house, this um, like, you know, this house where basically it's a house of cockroaches and like um, all this insects in the house, like, you know, seeing that and experiencing those, uh, those experience when I first moved to the States and it was like, wow, this is not what I expected. And that's not the, and that's like just the little thing. And I feel like, con- and coming to uh coming here and I have always knew that I know I was different I always felt different I always been different than uh than other normal uh, nor- those other kids that I grew up playing you know while my uh guy's friend uh, when we were young when my guy's friend go play soccer and go play sports I love dance I would go and dance with my girlfriends um and I would do theaters you know all those stuff like it's and like I never realized what it was you know um and coming to the states and seeing understanding uh what that part of me you know that part of me who wanted to do that uh the part of me that when a guy uh what a guy and a girl walk past by I'm like oh this is a really good looking man like where did that come from those kind of questions like I was living in this um this this life where I really didn't know who I was and Though there was a lot of challenges that came um, came came come to me, you know, uh, that I had to face, uh, realizing my sexuality, you know, and finally coming to the term where, to myself, where okay, maybe I am di- I am actually different than everyone in that way, you know, like I realized I was gay, and that was not the end of it with my sexuality, you know. After that, I had to navigate my way through. How do I? How do I? Uh, explain this to my family you know how do I explain this to my community um so that took a really big toll on me especially when I was in high school so and I definitely went uh through a very deep depression um where uh, like I was not doing very good and like you know and there was some substances I was using and like it was just like to cope with things and it just didn't it was not the ideal situation for this immigrant child who came to the States, you know, and um, had with this big dreams, but I'm very, but with all that, um, I'm thankful to say that I always had um, really great support system. Either it was with my friends, like uh, coming to high school and like, you know, all that. So I, I was very involved throughout high school. Like, you know, I, I need to, I knew that, you know, I had to do, extra hard I needed to do go uh do things get involved as much as possible and get great good grades and like you know that mindset of like okay I need to do something for my family because I'm the first one uh to go into off going off to college and doing all this so there so it was it was a lot of challenges that way you know and just like participating in school like I would dance in the morning at like you know practice from like 6 a.m I had to find a ride way to school at 6 a.m like you know to my uncle who would go to work at 4 a.m so like he would drop me off my uh off to my cousin who lived to my who lived by school and had to walk from there at my practice um like from taking a 30 40 minutes nap and like after that I would have theater practice at night until like 6 p.m and then get a, a transport like the public ride back home and make sure like you know I cook food for my family before they get home um at, before they get home from work so it was just of it was a way like you know it was a very crazy crazy way but I feel very um I feel stable with where I am right now and like I know I wouldn't be where I am today without those experiences that I had to go through. Um, 
though I do not wish all this <laughs> to anyone, but you know, it, I, I do want to say like, it will get better once you come to the term to accept for who you are and like, you know, acknowledging that your weakness is, but also knowing that, you know, it's okay. And it's okay to be this and be. Th so yeah, that was really something. And just coming, having a family who really does support you. And even though they don't understand, like they don't understand they will try to listen to you and you know try to get you so that was something that i'm really grateful for for and yeah i'm sorry I, that took a little too long no worries thank you thank you so much for sharing all um i came to us in 2012 and before coming to here uh you know martin luther king jr was my hero and I thought like, when, you know, reading his biography, his work, I thought, you know, the, uh, the history around um, uh, racism um, kind of uh, had already ended uh, because of Martin Luther King. That was my understanding. That was what I had heard. And, and when I came uh, like, Early 2012, when when I started working in the grocery store, like um, kind of most of the customers uh, used to kind of like ask me where I'm from, like uh, and being a refugee child, uh, the the idea of identity um, where I'm from has always been a big crisis in my life, and I'm sure um, you know. Most of you had, um, if you remember growing up in the refugee camp, um, I'm sure most of you have similar experiences. Um, I wanted to, I'm curious, like, you know, um, my observation, um, the early days of my uh, experience in this country was, um, I didn't know that this country is so black and white, like the racial divide, um, the tension between one race versus another race, and then and then I wasn't aware of like you know I fall into the brown category, and and then there is this like big question like you know where do we exist between this uh, between black and white? Um, um, I'm kind of like curious about your own observation. Um, when you look at the larger uh, scenario of this country, uh, did, did you have any kind of observation around that? On the... Yeah, so, um... I normally encounter um, scenarios where I'm being labeled as an Indian, you know, <laughs> so it's very ste stereotypical. It's so unfortunate, uh, but mm -hmm. the people in this country, they does not realize that the country is built on the base of immigrant blood, you know, so whole America, it's, it's all a part of melting pot, whatever concept that we bring in, it's so the main founding pillar, right, the standing pillars of America is based on the immigration, right? It's from mm -hmm. immigrant, no matter like you are born here, but your uh, ancestors are from somewhere else, you know, unless you are a Native American, then that's a different case. So it's very unfortunate that the discrimination is still exist and people still judge you by by your cover, you know? So yeah, I have I have seen that so many times in in workplace, in a school, in a grocery. I mean, normally you get treated so differently. Even if you wear like a hoodie to a store, and then you are like a different color, they instantly judge you right there. And then uh, even like a storekeeper, they will have eyes on you, no matter we, wh where you go around the store. So I have faced that personally. So yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Going piggyback of uh, of what Chandra Chandra said. Like, I so I work at Target, like in a grocery uh, retailer and stuff. So, and those things are very um common thing that I have to witness from a lot of my 
white team members a lot of the time, um, especially racially profiling um, customers. It's and and like not to give them excuse, like not to excuse their action. Like the, a lot of the time, it's so for white. Um, from my experience, like I, I been like I was very. And I got involved with white folks when I when I first moved to the state. It was just um, for me to be comfortable in this, you know, up to to this new place. So I definitely switched my <laughs> um, switch my uh, what I guess like culturally. I switched myself culturally when I first moved to the state. So I got to witness a lot of things. I feel like from the both side and like so and and those times where like I had to cut some people off from my life because I I couldn't. I just couldn't uh, accept a lot of the things that would, I, it was not something a lot of the time intentionally, it was just something that was engraved in their thing. It, it's like they wouldn't even realize the impact they, like with the words that they're saying, like um, just for example, a lot of the time, this uh, the white folks in my, my uh, work, uh, they will be watching people closely to the, uh, mostly like a lot of the time it's always BIPOC people, you know, and it's really frustrating to see that, um, see, see that, and because I do have friends who are, um, who are black, you know, who are brown, who even Nepali friends who have a very darker tone than, um, than uh, some of us, you know, and like even my little sister, she has a way darker tone than, oh, than me or my little brother. So I think this, uh, this stereotypes and things that really does impact our everyday life and just like being especially for me in my personal level I like I try to connect with people through experience more than um the racial and geographic the geographical uh place that we're born on because I feel like when when I do that I just find it hard for me uh for me to uh, connect with people or uh you know to find that feeling of home or like fi finding that connection with people because you, when I think that way it's just like oh they're not Nepali you know they would they will never understand me but I try to listen to other BIPOC people um and their stories and try to like you know empower each other to uh what we can do what uh, is like the actions that we can take to do better so I think um this the, the racial um tension between uh, in America I don't it has been better, I feel like, from when I when I first came, but I don't think it's going to go anywhere anytime soon. But I feel like this collective, uh, like, you know, learning of each other's culture and like learning and just respecting, um, respecting each other is going to help us move forward, I feel like. Thank you, Noel and Chandra, for sharing. You're listening to Apex Express, Acre Thursdays and KPFA 94.1, 89.3 KPFP and online at kpfa.org. Stay tuned in for more about Aru's Camp for Emerging Leaders Reflection. Kamana, uh, how about, um, I know, I mean, three of you are part of, were part of the Aru's Youth Leadership Camp uh, 2022 cohort. Um, Kamala, do you want to kind of share with us uh, your intention to join Aru's Youth Leadership Camp and share some of your experiences being part of the leadership camp? Absolutely. So going back to like um, last question. So for racism, I feel like I really, really struggled to find my community within the school because I never felt like I was a part of one of them. I try to find friends. I try to make friends. I'm like really outgoing. But neither with the teachers or the students did I ever get the opportunity to connect. And you think like I went here from fifth grade. So it would have been easier to integrate into the culture and stuff. But I never felt like I belong there. And even now, I do go to high school, but I do dorm moments. So I try to like be out of the high school as much as I can because some of my hardest struggles I feel like have been inside those school walls because even talking to teachers, I never felt like heard or felt recognized. Instead, I always felt like I was like undermined. And so I reached out from my community outside of the school walls. So I really, really try to be uh, a part of the Nepali community as much as I could, like speaking Nepali, being 
seeing someone who was Napoleon in the halls, that would always brighten up my day because it felt like that's a part of my identity. So uh, I joined ARU with the intention to meet new people that were from the same background that I was because that's what makes me feel validated. And I was really interested in the leadership camp because I wanted to grow, I wanted to learn about myself. And I was already doing some stuff in the community for my community, but I also wanted to learn more. I wanted the mentors, I wanted to be inspired. And I think after going to the camp, that's exactly what ARU did for me. It helped me recognize the problems that we have in our society and how I can not only just acknowledge it, but become a part of the solution. Thank you, Pamela, for sharing. How about Noel or Chandra? What was your intention? And um, can you please share us, share us some of the experiences being part of the Youth Leadership Camp? Sorry, I can go. <laughs> I can go. Um, first, um, like, yeah. So my in first intention uh, was to uh, reconnect with my roots and um, to my uh, to the uh, to fitness community. Um, like I had mentioned earlier, I after I moved to the state, just uh, because of my sexuality, one of the big reason was my sexuality that really made me very uh, distant from my community. So I just completely shot myself from going to Nepal events like you know hate, like just even reaching out to like Nepali friends or like even I moved to the states I had no connection with my Nepal like friends from Nepal or like friends that had moved to the states with like before I did you know like I used to reconnect with them uh, in the beginning of the years when I first moved in um, and like after realizing that my uh, about my sexuality and I just completely shut that off and like after that, it was just me and the American friends, you know, and like that's, I lived my life that way. Um, I lived as like the uh, quote unquote American teen life, um, teen's life uh, when I was, um, when I was in high school, uh, even in college, like beginning of college and not until like, you know, recent, really recently, 2020, 2019, um, being in college that kind of really made me realize what, what do I really want to do with life? And like, you know, uh, what what am I gonna do and who I am? Those questions started popping off. And one of the main reasons a lot of this stuff also happened because of like a lot of those um, activism that was arising against um, black life, against the police brutality and the the unfair treatment of black, uh, black individuals by the law enforcement and with Black Lives Matter movement rising up and with COVID, with a, like the Asian hate, all those stuff really put me in this place to like make me think about like my whole life, you know, and where do I, where do I come from, who I am, and like at, at that point, I had uh, my family had knew who I was, and like you know, I was being more comfortable of being myself and having conversation with my families about just our histories and all those stuff. So and then. Aru came in, uh, which I knew for a long time, but this year I, my uncle sent me an email, uh, messaged me, and was like, hey, set, set, like do this. And I was like, oh my God, yeah. And then I looked up and it was just exactly what I needed at the right, like, you know, the the perfect time timing because I had opportunity uh, before, but my mindset was not there to do those kind of activism. Like, um, and I always did have that place for it, but this, um, and just having this experience this year just totally like it changed me in a way like you know it, it made me see my community uh from the side that I have never seen like you know the side of like especially with the like this the traumas that my community had to deal with because of the displacement from Bhutan and moving to the States. And I, I really just started, started dissecting myself and my history and like, you know, how it's impacting me and my family and like my community. So that was definitely one of the main reasons I wanted to join, um, to learn about myself, you know, because I had questions um, of who I am and I still do. So, but I think um, since I started uh, 
being part of RU, I a lot of this questions are being answered for me. And I, I, yeah, that, and I hope that we can keep working, uh, working with, I hope to keep working with Aru in future and have a uh, make someone like who felt like, you know, me, who feels like me in future to make them feel connected to our community for our future generation. So that's really something that I am very grateful for Aru for making me, bringing me back to to my community, you know, to bringing back to my home, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Chandra, how about you? Do you want to share? Yeah, so uh, for me, I think I like wanted to relive my leadership life, you know, because uh, in the past I have attained a uh, few leadership camp and I have been mentor of leadership camp and um, and I was missing that experience. You know, it, it went a long time. The first camp that I did was back in 2011 as a student. It was a migrant leadership camp in Pennsylvania, right? It was a six-day camp, which happened in Millersville University in Lancaster. Um, so, yeah, I was missing those experience, and I just wanted to make a new connection and then see, um, like, what problems that our community are facing, what I can do, maybe, you know, try to involve in it. Uh, it particularly like triggered me from after the the the, the pandemic hit because uh, most of us were literally living in case right we were like isolated for like uh, two years and then normally somebody recommended I me mean, to the camp uh, DP that it's like why don't you join the camp and I was like okay so I've been in case for a long time. I have not make any interaction, like social interaction with people. And just wanted to make a new connection and see how I can blend into the community, you know, as a new identity, because uh, I didn't have the, uh, my spiritual identity in past when I used to did, uh, when I did those kind of a camp. And then... I was just wondering, like, I was just testing myself. Will I be able to fit in? Because uh, people normally kind of, you know, criticize you looking at your face, judging, like, what are you doing? What, what are you wearing that? <laughs> Aren't you missing your life being a spiritual or like trying to be religious? So I just wanted to test that on myself. So that's the initial reason to join the camp. And I was very glad that it did meet my expectations. And camp people were very nice and friendly. They gave my space. So yeah, I was very happy about it. And I did make a uh, lifelong connection uh, in the camp. So it's really good and I'm very happy about it. Thank you. I'm, I'm also very happy that you all joined our Lisa camp. Um, I know uh, by the uh, middle of the leadership training program, we divided um, the participants into three groups, um, storytelling group, mental health group, and education group. Now, can you tell us more about your group and the um, issues that your group is trying to address? Kamana, do you, do you want to begin? Sure, I can start us off. So for me, I we were able to pick the groups that we pro wanted to prioritize. And for me, education was really on the top because for me, I always felt that there was a barrier between my parents and I. And although they're so, so supportive and they're just amazing with that, they are illiterate. And my father was the oldest of his family and my mother was also the eldest of her family. So neither of them got to attend school at all. So for me, I also felt like education was a barrier, which is why I wanted to explore a little more into that disparity. And after um, talking to our previous mentors that have gone through this camp program before, they identified that there is a large group of high school dropout rates in Harrisburg. So after that, we um, spent some time like, trying to do surveys and stuff so we could see exactly what was the problem. Because after conversations with the leaders in Harrisburg also, we discovered that like they knew that this was an evident problem and stuff like that. But 
but they weren't aware of why. So we were like, why not start at the population that's impacted the most, right? So we started with the high school kids and um, we launched a survey. The results told us back that yes, this was an issue and that there were things that, hello? Go ahead, go ahead, Kamana. Oh, I'm so sorry. So we found out that like the issues were prominent in high school and we mainly focused on launching it in the summer. So we had a little bit difficulty getting enough participants, but at the end we did get like a good amount and we found out that it was because of finance stuff because they weren't able to get resources that they need. And our team and ARU joined together to now open a resource center in Harrisburg, which I think is so inspiring. I'm so ready for the next step. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kamana, for sharing. Um, Chandra, do you wanna talk about the mental health group? Yes, so um, I was part of mental health group. And as you know, um, our people have been have been through like a lot of difficulties in their life from like fleeing from country uh, and then spending their life as a refugee and then after that they had to overcome another hurdle moving to the moving to the new country which they have never thought of where it does not match their religion culture so it's totally different right and then there has been a lot of trauma. People were tortured and they have like lots of thing going on. It does not matter like whichever is there, right? So so mental mental health was one of the huge issue. And normally in community, there is a huge tabby about it. Like people doesn't know like how to acknowledge it or they don't think it exists. And um, that's really concerning. And it's it's hurting people day by day internally, but they does not realize that it's been harming them. So we just wanted to raise some awareness regarding that. So um, so in past sessions in our leadership camp, we tend to focus on mainly the youth section, the teenagers. So we decided to do a small research based on the substance substances abuse with the teen. Um, so what 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 is causing them to have such a problem? And for me, the reason behind me joining in mental group, mental health group was that I believe like the spiritual healing could be also the one of the potential solution to overcome that issue. So I thought, why not? Maybe I can pitch some spiritual idea and maybe they're going to help. So that's the initial reason I wanted to be the part of it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Nawal, do you, do you want to respond to that question? Nay, can you respond? To that? I mean, can you say the question one more time? Yeah. So, um, during the youth leadership training program, we divided the participants into three groups, right? A mental health group right. and education group, and you uh, were interested into storytelling group. So uh, can you right. tell us um, more about the storytelling group, um, what you all are doing, what uh, kind of uh, community issues that the storytelling group is uh, trying to address? Yeah, so there's two different uh, storytelling groups, but the one that um, that we're constant, constantly working toward right now is our performance um, performance piece that is focused on um, our personal story. And the reason I was uh, interested in storytelling was because I feel that um, just coming to Iowa, you know, and like just realizing that learning so much history, like so much thing about other people's history, like, you know, obviously it's empowering, um, but at the same, at the same time, it makes you question, right? Like, you know, 
what about my story? And like that, that may be a little selfish take on it, but at the same time, especially, you know, with just the treatment of um, Bhutanese people from the Bhutanese, uh, the Bhutanese monarchy and just the, just the way that the political scene played out, it's just so unjust to um, our people. And there's still uh, 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 political prisoners that are still in Bhutan that are serving uh, their jail time who were just trying to fight for their right to live in the land that they had been living for a long time. And I see nothing wrong with that. And I believe the stories and uh, you know, the struggle of my community, of my family, that uh, the journey that they had to take is worth of, um, worth of being, like, you know, those stories are worth of being told, worth of being heard. Um, and it is, I, I like talking about life. I like talking about um, learning about other people's stories, learning, uh, sharing my own stories. Um, so that was one of the main reasons uh, I wanted to do that. Um, plus, I do have like a little bit of uh, performance back background with doing theater back in camp. So that was definitely something that I did. And like right now we are, um, so this over this camp, um, the summer we all came up with our own you know, experience uh, living being an immigrant, being a refugee, and like, you know, uh, like how that has impacted us. And we all came up with a collective, a collective uh, script of, um, after writing our own personal stories. So right now we're, we've been meeting like, you know, every, every month, once a month this year after the, uh, after summer, but next once uh, 2023 starts, we'll be working like twice a month to, you know, really, um, clean our performance and like clean the stories that we're trying to sell like in a, um so and we'll be performing that in san francisco this summer in bay area um which i'm really excited about uh because we'll be able to share this performance uh to other communities uh who can who may relate to us you know who may feel heard and seen through our performance uh so yeah i'm just really excited to represent our um our community in in that aspect so yeah Great, great. Yeah, um, the the name of the performance uh, is called Merogit Meroyatra, right? And uh, Merogit Meroyatra, literal uh, translation would be my song, my journey. And and we look forward to perform at uh, YBCA in San Francisco, which is going to be exciting. Um, Thank you, thank you all of you for uh, sharing uh, your life journey, your experiences in the physics camps in US and uh, your experiences um, being part of the youth leadership camp. Um, before we close out, uh, do you want to share any final thoughts? After attending the leadership camp, camp, I felt like so heard, so validated. And I honestly think that if there's any other Bhutanese refugee youth out there, I definitely recommend ARU's leadership camp because it is a safe space for us all. And I think that we would always appreciate new bonds, new connections. Thank you, Pamela. Chandra, any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, so like to appreciate you for hosting us today and also wanted to especially thank Apex Express for giving us wonderful opportunity to share our experience over the leadership camp. And as Ikwe and Kamana, I would definitely suggest all the youth out there to come out and then at least play some role in um, uplifting this organization. And as long as you can also build some skills and grow along with the organization. So I'd like to invite every single one out there who's listening to us. Definitely should come out and try this leadership camp experience and learn a lot from it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. No more. Any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, I'm not like, um, I, my final thought would be um, just, Take your journey, like, you know, one by one and not to uh, 
not to sound like I'm giving advice or anything because I I'm still like myself going and going through this journey uh trying to navigate my own soul and trying to find myself so I think just be patient with yourself especially if you're someone listening who is a child of an immigrant it comes from the uh, experience that we have lived I just want to say that you know take your time trust your process um it's okay to be easy on yourself it's okay to um feel like that you don't belong because um that's such a, su- a sucky feeling but that part of this journey and uh, i think we lost novel um all right so uh, it's time to close uh, for t- tonight thank you all for joining uh, thank you for such a rich conversation uh, please check out our website kpfa.org backslash program backslash apex express to find out more about this show tonight and to find out how you can take direct action we thank all of you listeners out there keep resisting keep organizing keep creating and sharing your visions with the world your voices are very important FX Express is produced by Miko Lee, Jalina Kin Lee, and Pei Chong, and special editing by Swati Raisam. Tonight's episode was hosted by Robin Gurung and Asian Refugees United. Thank you so much to the KPFA staff for their support. Have a great night. Thank you. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. This is a community announcement. The Mercury 20 Gallery features works by its talented members in its Art for the Winter Solstice Showcase. The showcase starts December 2nd and extends through January. The main gallery has a selection of artwork highlighting a range of styles and mediums. The backroom gallery has smaller works that could serve as gifts. Mercury 20 is located at 475 25th Street in Oakland. For hours or more information, text 510-918-9093 or visit mercury20.org. The community calendar is produced by the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Please send your wheelchair accessible listing to calendar at kpfa.org. To hear this information again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621, or view it online at kpfa.org. Let us see. It happens all the time like this. Somebody will, that one person will be right there. And she was just crying. All right. We were getting ready to sing. All right. I hadn't even got the words out. She was already in it. And her eye, she was not too far away, but I just had to tell her to come here. And I held her hand and sang. And I said, 
See, I had a bad day. I've been performing and I got it all out. And I forget what I do. See, you better remember. Right. This is why you're doing it. You belong here to do this. This is your calling is to ignite something in people. To make them, let them know that they belong too. It's bigger than me. It always has right. been bigger right. than me. Mm. KPFA. Storytelling for social change. This is KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley and 88.1 KFCF in Fresno.